It's so good to be here and I'm really excited. Let me ask a question, guys. What are some of the things that keep people from accomplishing great things for God? Fear. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, you all said fear. Yeah. Pride. They don't know who they are. The posture of their hearts. Hesitation. Hesitation. Waiting for the <laughs> waiting for the right time. <laughs> Somebody already should be answering that altar call. I'm waiting for the right time. God told you 2,000 years ago, but you're still waiting for the right time. Uh huh. Sin. Yeah, because if you're sin, if you're in sin, you cannot obey God. You're going to find every excuse not to obey God. Yeah. Other things. Offense. Hey. hey, offense. By the way, let me, I don't even know, that one is a whole sermon by itself. Do you know the devil loves to use offense to keep you from obeying God? There are offended people all over the place. He just uses somebody to say something and then you get angry. They should have known. How could they do that? Maybe even somebody's already offended. How can Pastor M ask us to sit like this? And already... <laughs> Already you're just shut off. Just by being offended, already you're shut off from the blessing, isn't it? So offense will keep people from honoring God. There are so many things. And you know in the scripture, there are many people who had reasons why they couldn't honor God. So many people. Give me an example. Jeremiah. Jeremiah. What did Jeremiah say? I'm too young. <laughs> I'm too young. That was Jeremiah. In Jeremiah 1.6, he says, Alas. Can you put that? Jeremiah, Jeremiah 1.6. He says, Alas, sovereign Lord. I'm a youth. <laughs> I'm a youth, man. <laughs> alas! Yani alas is such a hard word to tell God. Alas! Yani you can't see God. I'm young. What are you asking me to do? I'm too young. What are, have you, was there somebody else who said I'm too old? Yeah. Sarah. Thank you. Sarah. And that was in Genesis 18.12. Can you put that up? Genesis 18.12. Sarah said something really interesting because she said the opposite of Jeremiah. Therefore, Sarah, in fact, how she laughed. <laughs> and she said, after I've grown old, shall I ha have pleasure, my Lord, being old also? The pleasure she was talking about is having a child. <laughs> yes, that's what she was talking about. <laughs> I could see your mind racing somewhere else. Shall I have this pleasure? I've been waiting for a child for all these years. And she's like, Lord, I'm too old. So there are people who maybe say, God, I'm too old. Are there people who say, I'm too old? Like, God, I don't have energy anymore. I'm too settled. Like, my, like even my money now is finished. I don't have the energy I used to have. I don't have the position. I'm too old now to serve. Other people like, do you remember what Moses' excuse was? I, I, I can't speak. I stammer. I don't like being in front of people. He said this in uh, Exodus 4.10. Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant. In fact, he said, oh Lord, I am not eloquent. Is there anybody in the house who's not eloquent? Let me just see. All the people who are not eloquent. Yeah? All the rest of you are very happy standing on stage. Huh? <laughs> I'm getting personal. <laughs> Neither before or since. You have spoken to your servant, but I'm slow of speech and slow of tongue. Wow. By the way, switch to NIV. Uh, for me, it's always NIV unless otherwise mentioned. And it's not because I believe it came from heaven. You know, there are people who believe certain versions came from heaven. <laughs> it's just that some are easier to understand and some, there's a difference in the translations and they are, they are good. If you're a King James Christian, praise God for you. But you're not more spiritual. <laughs> it's just, you know, there are some people who feel God spoke in King James English. He actually didn't speak in English. He spoke in Hebrew in the Bible, you know. So Moses said to the Lord, pardon your servant. That's like saying alas. Pardon your servant, Lord. I've never been elo eloquent, neither in the past, nor since you've spoken to me. Since you said I speak, you haven't changed. <laughs> I'm still the same. And it's like, I'm slow of speech and tongue. Things don't shikana easily for me. When I'm on stage, I get paralyzed. I start shaking. Is there anybody like that? Yeah. I, I, can't I can't speak and think at the same time. It's like they just catch each other. That was Moses' excuse. Like, Lord, I can't serve you. I can't. What did Gideon say? I'm insignificant. I'm too small. 
I'm from the least family. Remember, that's what he said. He said, he said in Judges 6.15, Pardon me, my Lord, but how can I save Israel? My clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my family. He's saying, I'm the last born. When I talk, nobody even seems to realize somebody has talked. By the way, are there any last bonds in the house? Yeah. I come for the family meeting and people are just talking around me. Wow. When I say, excuse me, ah, where? Get water. <laughs> what were we saying? What were the adults say? It's like, I'm the last person for anyone to listen to. I'm insignificant. I didn't grow up uh, wealthy. I didn't grow up in a place where people listen to me. How are they going to start listening? Nobody thinks I can do this. I'm from a poor background. I'm unqualified. I don't have the right education. Am I getting personal here? Yeah, that's Gideon. What did the rich young ruler say? I'm too rich. Is that what he said? I mean, he didn't say it, but he thought it, isn't it? Yeah, the Bible tells us that the, this guy went away. The young man had this. He went away. Sad. Why? He was too rich. I'm too important. That job of mine keeps me busy. I have to meet important people. Do you guys understand? Today I'm supposed to be in State House. I know I'm supposed to come for the gathering, but do you understand the kind of role I play? How important I am? What an importance. <laughs> yeah. There's a disciple that also gave a funny excuse. It wasn't a funny excuse because it was a legitimate excuse. And he was mentioned here on stage today. And this disciple told Jesus, I need to go and bury my father. Yeah? I need to go bury my father. Now, that's a hard one for us as Africans. Because, you know, I mean, the way, the, way the, script, the, the theologians tell us, it wasn't necessarily the burial ceremony, but in the Jewish custom, there was a year of mourning when you put together all the, the man's affairs, the way he ruled the home, things were settled. And the family was meant to be there to be, able to, to, to be able to deal with that. And the man is like, Jesus, let me go finish family business first. And then I can come and follow you. <laughs> that one, Jesus, was a little harsh, huh? What do you say? That's even hard for an African to say. <laughs> let the dead bury the dead. Yeah. If you're serious about following me, let's go now. That family of yours is a beautiful thing, but I gave it to you. Yeah. It's not even yours, it's mine. I'm the one who trusted it to you. I'm too young. You know, my children are young. They need me. I can't leave them. I can't serve God. You understand right now we have to take them to school. I mean, those are legit. By the way, that one I'm saying it with fear and trembling. Because it's not, it's not an easy one. It's not an easy one. But Jesus says, no, no, no. If you put me, if you put your children above me, that's idolatry. What? Yeah, that's an excuse. Follow me. Yeah, I know. I'm getting personal. I know. Even if you don't tell me, I know. <laughs> so this weekend, I want to talk about something that God really put on my heart. And it was interesting because I had actually planned this gathering from the beginning of the year. I already had planned the content I was going to share. I already had thought through some of the things. And then a week ago, the Lord just told me, shelve all that. And he said, this is what I want you to talk about. I was like, God, you should have told me this in January. <laughs> I've had so much time to prepare, you know. But, you know, that's not how, that's him, he operates the way he wants to operate. And that's how he, I've learned to be like this with him. And he knows why. He probably knows that I've overthought it and brought my own thoughts into it. And it's like, let me tell you when I know you don't have time to bring your own thoughts. So that you share what I want you to share. So this whole weekend, I'm going to be teaching. The theme of this gathering is catch the anointing catch the anointing. Because I want to teach you, yeah, this is a catchment area. Because <laughs> are you guys who are close? Eh? <laughs> this catchment area, we're going to be talking about catching the anointing. And, and I really want to talk about the fact that there's a thing that in your life you need desperately to be able to achieve the thing that God is calling you to do. All these excuses come out of fear. There's a fear we all have when God calls. But there's something that if God was to do in your life, and I believe he wants to do it this weekend, 
that it will completely change you. When the disciples, people saw them afterwards, they couldn't recognize them. They said, this, ah, who are these people? They said, unschooled people. But they noted that these ones have been with Jesus. Something had changed. And I believe it's not something, they didn't go to school. They didn't have time to have gone and done a, de- a degree from the time Jesus had died. It wasn't that they went and psyched themselves. It wasn't that. Nothing had changed in their circumstance except that an amazing power entered their life. And I'm going to be talking about the power of what, what anointing is. Because I believe that anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit in your life to enable you to carry out God's purpose that he it intends for you. That's what we're going to be talking about. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6. Zerubbabel was building the temple. And he was, it was a big thing. It was something that he was really intimidated by. And, he, and the prophet said to him, Zechariah 4, 6, This is a word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord God Almighty. God was telling him, you know what? It's not human power. It's not human thinking. It's not human resources that will build this. There is a power of the spirit that I will deposit in you that will make it possible for you to do things other people cannot do. That's the power of anointing. We learned at the beginning of this year that spiritual battles cannot be fought with physical weapons. You can't. There are some things in your life you will never achieve until you have the equipping, spiritual equipping, to achieve those things. And that's what we're going to be talking about this weekend. Because I believe that the difference between those who achieve great things for God and those who don't has nothing to do with youth or years. It has nothing to do with money. It has nothing to do with preparation or education. It has everything to do with the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit. That's the difference. That's what makes the difference. And so this first talk, I'm going to call it the importance of anointing. Because I want to first begin by painting a big picture about this. In the Bible, whenever you talked about anointing, it, there was a, a physical thing that went with it. The picture of anointing was, remember what, how would people be anointed? Oil being poured. And the prophet would come and pour oil on someone's head. And that would symbolize the power of the Holy Spirit that was upon that person from that time henceforth to carry out the task for which they had been anointed. And it's very interesting because in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, this has become one of my favorite verses. Peter talks about how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power. He he distinguishes those two things, and I'll explain why. With the Holy Spirit and power. And how he went around doing good and healing all who are under the power of the devil because God was with him. You notice that he was anointed with the Holy Spirit and with power. And from that time on, he was able to go around healing people who are under the devil's power and delivering people because from that time on, the power of God was with him. Now, I want you to notice something in that verse, and I, and, and I think I ought to distinguish it. This is not talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit. Every Christian is supposed to be filled with the Holy Spirit. This is a command. Paul actually says it. He says, do not be filled with wine. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. That's, uh, what verse is that? Ephesians 5.18. Yeah, there it is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled. It's not a suggestion. That's actually a command. You should be filled with the Holy Spirit. One of the things you need to understand, every Christian has the Holy Spirit in him. Oh, ha. The minute you receive Christ and you pray and ask God to come into your life, something supernatural happens at that point. The Holy Spirit of God enters your life, takes residence in you. Every follower of Jesus has the Holy Spirit. So that one you don't need to be commanded. It's already there. But then Paul says another step. He says, be filled. In other words, don't just have the Holy Spirit, but there's something you must do because the Holy Spirit needs to fill you. A cup can have something, but when you're filled, there's an overflow. It starts to pour over. And Paul is leading us into a place where we begin to understand it's my role to invite the Holy Spirit every day to fill me and to overflow out of me. To actually invite his power to take over and to rule my life. The Holy Spirit can be there, but I've not invited him to take over. I'm doing things on my own strength. 
So one of the things I always do, and let me give you guys this. Every time we do confession prayer, we always confess the things that we're asking God to remove from us, isn't it? Lord, forgive me for this sin. Lord, forgive me because I've done this or I've done that. But the one thing I always do in that time of confession, and I want to throw this out because I think we should always, always do this, is at the end, I always ask God to fill me with something else. I can't be exiting something without being filled with something in return. So at the end of that prayer, I always pray, even if the leader has not asked me to pray, I always pray, Lord, fill me now with your Holy Spirit. As I've confessed my sin, enter, invade my life. Every part of me, my thoughts are yours. Take over my, my tongue. Take over my hands. Lord, fill me with yourself. So that as I go into today, people will not see me. They will see you. So I ask God to fill me because it's a command. God wants to be invited. He won't fill you unless you're the one who invites him to fill you. So that's what filling with the Holy Spirit is. It's a completely different concept from what we're talking about. What I'm talking about is the Holy, Holy Spirit's power to accomplish your specific calling. Every one of us has a specific calling. Every single one of you, there's something God re uh, requires because he created you for something. You are shaped for a purpose. None of us is here by accident. Look at your neighbor. Do they look accidental? Not at all. Not at all. No. Please reassure them. You are here for purpose. Yeah. There's a reason why God created you and he made you just the way you are. Some of you are so loud. <laughs> you announce yourselves before anybody has even seen you. We just know you've entered. Your personality goes ahead of you and announces you. <laughs> yeah? So, <laughs> Some of you are so quiet. You can sit on a chair and somebody looks and just sees the chair and even, you're not even, they're not even seeing you. Yeah. God is so amazing. He didn't make us uniform. He didn't make us the same. Some of you talk, express yourselves easily. Some of you are shy. Some of you think deep thoughts. Jokobudi. <laughs> Have you, have you sat with Joe and just had a, a casual conversation? Let's talk about the weather, Joe. It's been raining. How do you feel about the rain? What? You're about to drown in tectonic shifts at that point. <laughs> that's that's and condensation. <laughs> Some of you are so deep in your thoughts. Others of you, depth has nothing to do with you. <laughs> you are famous for your lack of depth. <laughs> it's actually a gift. You have no depth at all. You speak fast and then you think about what you've just said. <laughs> you even hear yourself as you're thinking, oh, I just said, oh, wow, that was good, man. You even laugh after you've cracked the joke. You're like, wow. <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, God made us all unique. Because he made us for a unique purpose. Your purpose is different from mine. That's why you don't, use a diff you don't use the same tool to accomplish two different tasks. When you want to cut a piece of wood, you don't take a hammer. No, you don't do that, isn't it? You get a saw. But when you want to hit a nail, you don't take a saw. It won't help you. So God has made us each amazingly unique because he has amazingly unique tasks for us to achieve. Yeah. And anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit for you to achieve your unique task. That's what anointing is. And you need anointing. You need anointing. Let me give you a few things, a few reasons for why you need anointing. Can I tell you why you need it? Number one, anointing makes room for you. Anointing makes room for you. Come on. Proverbs 18, 16 says, A man's gift makes room for him and brings him before great men. There's a way that God's power in you will make room for you. The unique power that God has put in your life will open doors for you. It will create room. It will expand the space that you have. 
It will promote you beyond the level where you belong. You find yourself in places where you're wondering, how am I here? How did I enter into this space? When anointing comes into your life, people will talk about you when you're not there. And you find yourself invited to speak in places where you're wondering, how did they even learn about me? It opens the doors. That's what the anointing does. There are certain places you just find yourself, you'll be like, what happened? How come I'm the one who is here? You know, you find yourself having opportunities and you wonder, how did this opportunity happen? And it's the anointing, the power of the anointing in you that will create those open spaces for you. Now, there are some of you who are so humble and you're like, I don't really need to be with great people. Me, I'm humble. I just like being by myself anyway. I don't need this anointing. That's false humility. That's actually false humility. Huh? <laughs> One preacher said, you know, it's like some people say, um, why do I need to fly? I like being around the chickens. <laughs> Listen, you were created to be an ego. God created you to soar and to fly. There are places God wants you to enter into that he, you have no idea right now. My prayer is that this weekend you're going to start understanding that you're an ego. You're going to understand where you're supposed to be flying. You're going to understand that there's a voice that you have that needs to be heard. Yeah. There's a big voice you have. I'm sure Peter was walking around thinking, I'm just a fisherman, until the anointing came. Then he began to speak in the Sanhedrin. The leadership of the whole nation was listening to him. He was determining the agenda of the leadership. Yeah. There's a voice that God has given you. And the power of the anointing is what will open that door in your life. The second thing that anointing will do, anointing makes you strong. Anointing makes you strong. God's people, you need this anointing. It makes you strong. Romans chapter 1 verse 11. Paul says to the, the church in Rome, he says, I long to see you. I long that I may impart on you a spiritual gift that will make you strong. Yeah. Paul's like, you know, I mean, listen, these guys already had this. They had the Holy Spirit. They're Christians. So he's not, he's not saying I'm coming to make you Christians or, or I'm coming to give you the Holy Spirit. They already have the Holy Spirit. But he's saying, I long to impart on you. There's something you're lacking, a spiritual gift. And he's saying, when I impart on you, you will be strong. You will be different from how you are right now. Anointing makes you strong. Anointing gives you authority that people will follow you. Anointing will actually cause your words to have weight that they didn't have before. The, the fisherman, the one who disowned Jesus, a few days before. And now he stands up and he speaks and 3,000 are added to their number. That's the power of anointing. It can't, be, it can't be him because we already know his results. Peter was that guy who spoke before he thought. He's in the middle of a spiritual revelation seeing Moses and Elijah. I mean, the, the, nobody in the world has ever seen anything like that. And what is he thinking? <laughs> uh, so, so, <laughs> so we just built some tents. We hung out. I'm sure Jesus looked at him like, <laughs> too soon. It's not the right time. I mean, that was, that was Peter, just a completely planless guy. But now he stands up with authority and he speaks over Jerusalem and 3,000 people are saved. Wow. The anointing makes you strong. It causes you to do things you never dreamt you could do. By the way, if you're tired of always being at the same level as a Christian. And by the way, I think you need to get tired. You can't be praying the same prayers you were praying last year. You can't be trusting God the same way you are trusting God last year. You can't just be going around in circles. There are people who have been Christians for, you're, you're 50, you got saved at 20, and you, your life hasn't, it's, you're still praying the same. In fact, you even have less passion than you used to have for God. We need to get tired of that, God's people. That is not our portion. Tell your neighbor, that's not your portion. Yeah. God wants you to get better and better. Pastor Milton reminded us of that today. Anointing is what's going to take you to the next level. If you want to be a fearless influencer, you need anointing. If you want to impact and change that corrupt workplace of yours, you need anointing. You can't do it without it. If you want to raise children who honor and love God, you need anointing. Let me tell you, you need anointing for this work. 
Yeah, if you want to make disciples, you need anointing. If you want to run a kingdom business, you need anointing. You need anointing. The third thing about anointing, anointing gives you impact. Anointing gives you impact. Acts chapter 10, verse 38. I read that already. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. You know, it's very interesting because Jesus already had the Holy Spirit. It's not like for 30 years he hadn't had the Holy Spirit. He, he was conceived by the Holy Spirit. In fact, his, his cousin, the one who went ahead of him, who was just a messenger, the Bible tells us John was filled with the Spirit from childbirth. Yeah. So this child had the Holy Spirit. Jesus obviously had the Holy Spirit. But there's something very interesting that happens. Jesus goes and is baptized by John. And the Bible says the Holy Spirit comes down upon him as a dove. And he's anointed by the Holy Spirit. And from that time on, his life changes. Even Jesus demonstrates for us that his life changes, that he, need, he needs anointing. And from that point on, the Bible tells us he goes out with power, doing good and healing all who are under the power of the devil. You need the anointing. The anointing gives you impact. You know, if you struggle sometimes to invite people to your discipleship group, and you invite them, and somehow you just, they don't seem to ever come. My friend, you need anointing. Perhaps there's something you need to try. And it's called the anointing. If you're at that place where you're inviting people to your service, and they just never seem to listen to you, I want to put it to you. You need anointing. There's something you need. It's not strategy. Strategy is good, by the way. I have nothing against strategy. It's not a better communication plan. Communication is good. I'm the, best, I'm the biggest advocate of it. It's not that. It's not more flyers. You need the power of the Holy Spirit. You need anointing. If you're asking your people to tithe and they never tithe, you need anointing. You need anointing. You know, part of the problem you might have in life is that you're operating anointing free. Hey. Hey. <laughs> You've heard of gluten free. <laughs> <laughs> Lacto, huh? fat free <laughs> huh? cholesterol free now you, you are anointing free <laughs> let me tell you that is not a good equation for ministry when you don't have anointing ministry is tedious and f you just find that there's no impact it's laborious thank you that's a good word is that a Lua who said it no it's <laughs> Such a good word. Laborious. Ha! Pastor George, come on. <laughs> you need anointing in your ministry. You need anointing in your office. If you've been a Christian in that office for the last 10 years and nobody knows you're a Christian, I tell you, you need anointing. There's something missing that you need. You know, I love the story. We've been learning about the Shunammite woman, isn't it? And Elisha tells her, what can I do for you? And as Pastor Milton reminded us, she has no, she has no clue who she's talking to. And she's like, you know what? I'm, I'm Niko Sawa too. Niko too sour, huh? I'm, I'm good. I mean, I'm, I've got a nice house. I've got a husband who loves me. I've got, a I've got a nice car. I've got a nice mansion. I'm okay. I'm okay. Uh -uh. But that man has something that you don't have. Yeah. Elisha had something money could not buy. Wow. Yeah. When you have anointing in your life, you have something money cannot buy. You have something the people in your office cannot strategize. Yeah, they can't. There's something in your life that everybody around you needs because they don't have it. And Jesus, wherever he went, people stopped what they were doing because they knew this person has something that I need in my life. That's the power of the anointing. The last thing is the anointing makes you fruitful. The anointing makes you fruitful. Acts chapter 1 verse 8. But you will receive power. When the Holy Spirit comes on you, and what will happen? You become my witnesses to Judea, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. That is the secret of ministry. Jesus says, don't leave. Stay until the power comes. Yes, you've been with me. Yes, you have the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus had told the disciples, receive the Holy Spirit. The book of John tells us that, and he breathed on them. Receive the Holy Spirit. So they already had the Holy Spirit. But there's something they were lacking. 
There's a power. The power of the Holy Spirit. And he says, when you receive power, you'll be able to go and make disciples everywhere. If you want to be fruitful as a Christian, you need anointing. Yeah. If you've got people in your family who are not saved and you're wondering why you've prayed for so many years, I want to put it to you, you need anointing. You need anointing. What I'm trying to say is you cannot grow a spiritual work without spiritual power. You need power. You need power. And that's why anointing is the most important ingredient for anything that God has called you to do. It's the most important ingredient for ministry. It's the most important ingredient for church growth. It's the most important ingredient for your power, for your achieving the purpose that God created you for. And my prayer is, by the end of this gathering, you're not going to leave here with strategy. You're going to leave here with anointing. Yeah. But there'll be a difference. Because of the understanding you'll receive and the impartation you're going to receive, that there will be a difference. There will be a boldness. These men had run away when Jesus was being arrested. In fact, they ran so badly, they left their clothes. Can you imagine somebody leaving clothes? <laughs> like you've seen cops and then you run and you run naked. Like just think about, think about it for a minute. Use your sanctified imagination. Stop thinking about it biblically. As in you're just seeing you with your boy, then the cops come for the guy. Huh? Pastor Gordy, can I? Can, so, so, Pastor Gordy is my boy. And he's like, Pastor M, I'll die for you, man. I'm with you, man. I'm with you, man. Then the cops come. Huh? Green army. Huh, Pastor? Chris, Chris, come. You're the cop. Inglia Pale. OCS. Sometimes you need to visualize these things, guys. Ah, yeah. So, you knock, you come, huh? Boom, boom, boom. Wow, 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 wow. <laughs> this is a guy who has said he's dying, you know. The, like, the funny thing is, it's funny when he leaves his jacket. But in the Bible, this guy left all his clothes. In fact, there's no indication that there was even underwear that, was, that he went with. <laughs> he just went. That's the guys before they have the anointing. They're anointing free. And then the anointing comes. And what are these people doing now? They are preaching. They are bold. They are told not to preach about Jesus. And then they are beaten and flogged. Capital punishment. And then they release, they're released. And what do they go saying? We have, no, in fact, they say, my goodness, we have suffered for Jesus. Wow. Come on. Even me, look. I was even hit here. Wow. What a privilege. Come on. They are unstoppable. You can't do anything to stop them. They're killed. In fact, one of them is killed. James, the leader of the church, is killed. And what do they do? They preach and the Holy Spirit power comes. And the place is shaken and they preach more. Hey, shh. Tell your neighbor, you need the anointing. This is a thing that we need. The anointing is the power of the Holy Spirit to accomplish your specific calling. This is the assignment that God has for you. And this is the power he has for that assignment. Now, I'm going to tell you four truths about the anointing. There's going to be a lot of content, by the way. And let me give you, let me give you a clue, by the way, with this gatherings. I, I give you content because I assume you're going to listen to it again yeah. and again. Yeah. So don't come, take it like high school, where you write the notes and then you burn the notes afterwards. This, this stuff is life. So go over it, review it, think through it, meditate on it. Because I believe that even as you listen to it, God is going to do something in your life through it. Four truths about anointing. Number one, anointing is caught, not taught. It's transmitted, not caught. It's not taught. You can't go to a school. There's no school for teaching anointing. Paul wrote this to his disciple Timothy. He says, 1 Timothy 4.14, Do not neglect your gift which was given you through prophecy when the body of elders laid their hands on you. So the gift didn't just come. It came through prophecy when hands were laid. Hands were laid. And then Paul even reminds us whose hand specifically was laid. Because later he says in 2 Timothy 1.6, For this reason, I remind you, 2 Timothy 1.6, to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. When those elders were praying, in fact, it's me who laid my hands on you. And he says, there's a gift that was put in you. Fan it into flame. 
There's something that happens. There's, there's actually, anointing is not taught. It's something that is caught. It is transmitted. It is passed on. Timothy didn't receive this gift in a university or a seminary. It was transferred through the laying on of hands. Come on, Joe. <laughs> and I have nothing against universities, by the way. But there's something university cannot give you. There's something university cannot give you. And that is called the anointing. Amen. It's important to understand from the onset that only God himself can give you anointing. So when I talk about transmitted and you see somebody laying on hands, it's not that person who's laying on hands who's giving you the anointing. They are a transmitter. They are a channel. But it is God who gives anointing. By the way, if you miss this one, you're going to, you're going to leave this whole gathering with the wrong idea. You're going to be saying that we are worshipping people here. No, no, that's not what I'm saying. God is the only one who can give the power of the Holy Spirit. But the interesting thing is God has chosen to work through human beings to transmit his power. I don't know why, but whenever you see God wanting to raise a king, he sends a prophet to anoint the king. There's a kingship anointing that is passed on. And it is not the king who gives himself that anointing. God entrusts someone with the gift for you, the power for you. This person is just a, they're just a human being. You know, John, the one who baptized Jesus, he, I mean, imagine he, Jesus himself submitted himself to another human. You think about it. This is the I am, the maker of the galaxies and the universe, who has come now as a human being. And then he comes and says, baptize me. Even John who understands is like, ah, I cannot. Even your shoes and your sandals, I cannot untie. And Jesus says, no, no, we must do this. Why? Because it is important for all righteousness to be fulfilled. Jesus is saying, I need to symbolize this for the people who will come after me. They need to understand that they need to submit and be anointed. And he comes and he's baptized by this same John. John himself was very humble about it. Because John said, in, when his disciples came, by the way, after that, Jesus' ministry just started to fly. And his disciples were baptizing. So his people came and said, Jesus, the, uh, John, the man you baptize, he's baptizing people. And now more people are going to him than us. And John reminded them. In John chapter 3, verse 27, he says, A person can receive only what is given to them from heaven. So it's like, guys, don't get it twisted. The gifts you saw in me were not from me. Even me, I received them. I'm just a carrier, a transmitter of God's gift. I'm just a vessel. Whenever you see a, ma a man of God, don't worship a man of God. Just understand what they are. They are a transmitter. Wow. God has given them the ability to transmit something to you. They are not special in, in any other way, except that they are carrying something special in them. And they have something special for you. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, that's why Paul says, I long to see you that I can give you a gift. Paul is far from Rome. He's not even saying, by the way, because, because, because I'm far, uh, let me invite your pastor. He says, no, no, no. I myself, there's something I have that all of you need. And I'm longing to come for, to Rome because I know I have a unique thing that God has for you. Paul eventually went to Rome as a prisoner, by the way. Uh, he, God had to use very extreme measures. He was taken on state. The state paid for him. It was a state visit. <laughs> he was transmitted as a prisoner to, to Rome. And then he imparted the spiritual gift. We, we presume at that point he was able to impart the gift that he came to impart because Paul was put under house arrest and the church could come and visit him anytime. And so he actually fulfilled this wish that he had. There's something that God has poured into me for you and I long to pass it on. This is something you need to understand that even when you're a spiritual parent, there's something God has given you that you are supposed to pass on to those who you shepherd, to those whom you lead. Number two, it is difficult to get an anointing. If it was easy, everybody would have it. Every Christian would have it. Second Kings chapter 2, verse 9 to 10, it says, When they crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me what I can do for you before I'm taken away from you. What did Elisha say? Give your, he, said, no, he said, give me a double portion, isn't it? He said, give me a double portion of the anointing that I've seen in you. Elisha is ambitious. <laughs> He's like, I don't just want you to transmit. I want a double portion. And what does Elijah say? <laughs> you have asked a difficult thing. 
you've asked a difficult thing. Like if you knew what you're asking for, like I don't even think you know what you're asking for. That is such a big thing you're asking for. You're asking a double portion of what God has already put in me. But he said, nevertheless, if you see me being taken away from you, it will happen to you. And guess what happens? Elisha sees it, isn't it? And then from that time on, he has a double portion. He does double the works that this prophet Elijah does. But Elijah told him, you're asking a difficult thing. This is not an easy thing you're asking for. Being anointed is not like being filled with the Spirit, which is for everybody. I believe that there are certain things that are requirements for you to be, <laughs> to be anointed. By the way, it's easier to get a certificate from a Bible school. Yeah. It's, it's easier to just go get a certificate and start a church. <laughs> start a ministry. Yeah, it's much easier. Uh, getting anointed is very different. There's, 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 a, there's a cost to it. We'll actually talk a bit about the cost of anointing later. But there's a cost to anointing. The third thing I'll say is you must have a desire, a strong desire. Tell your neighbor, strong desire. You must have a strong desire for the anointing. You must want it. It's not just given to anybody. You must want this thing for yourself. Jacob had a strong desire for his brother's anointing. He, he thought of how he can get this anointing from his brother. <laughs> and because he was a very carnal man, he thought of carnal ways to get it. He even bribed the guy with, with, with soup. I don't think he thought it would work. But his brother was very carnal-minded as well. He despised the anointing, the firstborn's anointing. He says, who cares if I die? I mean, what will a, what will a, what will a family birthright help me with if I die? Give me the food. You can have the firstborn anointing. He, he didn't care for it. So guess what happens? Jacob receives the anointing of the firstborn. From that point on, something shifts in his life. Anointing will always do what wealth cannot do. Because remember afterwards, Esau received the wealth. Jacob received the blessing. Jacob received the anointing. Esau had all his father. His father was a very wealthy man. Esau was left at home and he had everything of his father's. Jacob went with only the, coat on his, the clothes on his back. That's all he left home with. But guess what? That's all he needed. When you have the anointing, you don't need wealth. He comes back, he has more than his brother. He becomes a bigger nation than his brother. Why? Because it's not wealth he needed, it's anointing. Esau missed the point. He thought, it's, it's, it's like, I, I still have the things at home. He didn't understand. No, no, no. The anointing is what you need. Listen, people, you must want the anointing. You must be willing to fight for it. You must be willing to fight God for it. Wrestle God for the anointing. Wrestle him for what is yours. You must be passionate about this. You know, some of us are very cool, calm. Such a good God. Amen. Uh, let me ask the, tech, the, the uh, technical team, if you could open the flaps, the ones at the back, so it's not too warm in here. Uh, when we come together as a family, we need some fresh air also. And that's not thing, I'm not saying anything personal, by the way. It's me. It's me. It's not you. <laughs> it's me. It's me. It's me. The anointing of breath fresheners. Have you guys ever heard about that one? There's some guys who can anoint you just by breathing out. <gasps> You're slain. <laughs> and it's not the Holy Spirit, by the way. <laughs> That's a discipleship thing, by the way. Teach your disciples to have breath mints. Huh? It's a very good thing. This is not part of the sermon. It's just, it's, it's just a good thing to have breath mints. Amen. Amen? <laughs> Elisha had... Uh, 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 actually, Elijah, let's not even go to Elisha. Elijah had a servant who was supposed to be the person who inherited his anointing. Did you know that? Yes. And did you know that you don't even know the name of that servant? Yes. No, no, Gehazi was Elisha's servant. You see, that's the thing. You don't even know that guy's name. This is a, remember when there's a time Elijah was praying for rain yes. after there was a drought. Yes. And he prayed seven times. And he kept sending his servant to check for the rain. That dude 
should have been the one who received the double portion. He should have been the one, isn't it? But there was another young man who wanted it. His name was Elisha. And this man, Elijah even told him, by the way, go back home. Where I'm going, you can't come. Mm. And the guy says, what do you say? Anywhere you go, I'm going. Be it ever. He used one of those hard biblical things. Be it ever so, be severe on me if I don't come with you, but I'm coming. He he even refused the instruction. He said, that instruction I'm not taking. If you're dying, I'm dying with you. Yeah. He desired it. He, three times, Elijah told him to turn back. Three times, he persevered. He said, I'm dying with you. And eventually, when Elijah was going, he says, what do you want? And he was ready with his request. I'm here because I want your anointing. Yes. You must desire the anointing, people. Yes. Yeah. You know, some people think God is unfair. How come I'm passed all the time? How come people come and join the ministry after me and they just seem to propel and move fast? How come nobody notices all the faithfulness I've been faithful here? Tell your neighbor, desire the anointing. Desire the anointing. This man desired it. Desired it. He desired it. He's saying, give me a double portion of your spirit. You can't give a person your spirit. So it's not a spirit he's asking for. He's asking for anointing. Give me a double portion of the power that is working in you. I want it in my life. Elijah, Elisha knew, well, if I'm left behind, I need to have the power this man has for the calling God is calling me to. You must desire it. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 1, it says, here's a trustworthy saying, whoever aspires to be an over- overseer desires a noble task. You know what an overseer is? An overseer is a pastor. An overseer is a pastor. If you're desiring to be a shepherd, if you're desiring to pastor people, he says, that is a noble task. Desire it, God's people. Desire it. You know what? If you don't desire to be a pastor, you're disobedient. (laughs) Did you know that? Because Jesus' command is what? Go and make disciples. He didn't say go and make money of all nations. He, He didn't say that, did he? He didn't say go and make children, uh, <laughs> go and get married and have children in all that. He didn't say that. He said go and make what? Disciples. disciples. And when you make disciples, they need to be shepherded, which means they need a pastor. The minute you start making disciples, you become a pastor. So desire to be an overseer. You must desire it, people. Right now, if you're not shepherding anybody, you should be desiring it. Yeah. Don't be sitting here desireless. Because you'll also become anointingless. Yeah. Desire it. Desire. And when you're, desi- when you're leading your, di- your discipleship group, desire for this group to grow. Desire for it to multiply. Desire to shepherd more people. Because this is why you're here on earth. When you go to heaven, the streets will be lined with cash, with gold. So don't spend your whole life chasing what will be tarmac in heaven. Align your life with eternal things. Desire it. You must desire it. Number four. Number four. This one you're going to like. (laughs) You're going to like number four. You can desire someone else's anointing. (laughs) You can desire. This is a very interesting thing. You're not supposed to envy people. But when it comes to anointing, you can desire someone else's anointing. You can say, "I, I like this gift this person has. I like the anointing in their life. I want this in my life. Elisha looked at Elijah and he says, I desire this man's anointing. I've seen him call rain when the, when the place there was a drought and he prayed and rain came. I want this man's anointing. I've seen him strike the Jordan and the river parted. I want this man's anointing. And he says, in fact, I don't even want it. I want double. Come on, somebody. Yeah, I want double. When you see Pastor Milton here, praying and people are healed, you should be saying, I want double a portion of that anointing. Yeah. Yeah. When you see Pastor James here prophesying, you need to be saying, I want double the portion. Yeah. When you see Pastor Godwin planting churches in in other countries, you need to be saying, I want to have the boldness to do this. Yeah. When you see Pastor Kilonzi globetrotting, speaking in international stages, Ah, you should be saying, I want to go to twice the countries this man has gone to. Ah. (laughs) 
When you see Pastor Victor with such authority, wisdom, you need to be saying, I desire this man's wisdom. Lord, I want double portion. I want double portion of this anointing. And if anyone asks me they want a double portion of mine, I'll tell you, you're asking a difficult thing. Yes. <laughs> but with the Lord, all things are possible. So desire it, people. Desire it. You know, when I was young, I went to um, a church called Willow Creek Church. It was the first church I'd been to that was a massive mega church. It was full of people who had, most of them had given their lives to Christ in that church. And most of them had become radically transformed. Most of them had crazy testimonies of how they used to dance in bars and how they were thugs. And I remember thinking, I've never seen a church like this in my life. A church for people who didn't like church. I say, Lord, I want to be like this man. Yeah. By the way, this is a, I've never told you guys this story. I remember, and I was a student at that time. I, I must have been 22. And I remember saying, Lord, I desire what this man has. I began to read all his books, by the way. I think I read every single book that man wrote. Listen to his sermons online. I desired to learn from him. I desired the anointing he had. Years later, I was called to start a church. Guess what that church became? A church for people who didn't like church. Yeah. Nairobi's first church like that. Yeah. And when people came and asked, you know, people are so uncomfortable. People are like, you can't have a church like this. This is too liberal. You're not, you're not supposed to be entertaining people. You should be teaching them about hell and, and how they're going to go. And, and I'm like, no, 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 no. It's okay. I know what I'm here for. I'd seen it somewhere else. I desired it. It was someone else's anointing, but I desired it. And it became my anointing, by the way. Yeah. At some point, I realized I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, like the apostle Paul. He was different from the other pastors. And it wasn't a bad thing. It's not like the other pastors were bad. They had a role they were playing, but God had called me to reach people nobody else was reaching. Wow. Yeah. At some point, I became so content because the church had grown big. It was full of people. It was a successful church in Nairobi. Everybody thought we have arrived. But in my heart of hearts, I kept reading the Great Commission, go and make disciples of all nations. And I looked at this thing that I was leading. I realized this thing is too slow, too clumsy. It's too rich. It's too full of itself. It cannot make disciples of nations. And I don't say that in any negative way for those of you who are part of the ministry of those years. I just looked at how we're constituted. I said, it doesn't matter how much we try. We can't reach the nations like this. And I desired greatly. At that point, I didn't even know what to look at. I desired. I couldn't find models. I went around the world and I studied different models. The people who are doing what I thought I should be doing, they don't write. I didn't find books like Bill Ibels. And Bill Ibels had not done it, so I couldn't even read his books anymore. But I remember one time I met a man called Bishop Doug. Come on. Bishop Doug Hayward Smith. And I said, here is finally a man who is doing the thing I dream of doing. He not only is doing it, but he's written books about how to do it. And you know, it's very interesting. If an ordinary person reads Bishop Doug's books for the first time, you get offended. They're offensive. They don't make sense. They don't make any sense at all. But can you believe it? For me, when I read those books, they make perfect sense. I'm able to clutter, read through all the culture things and to see exactly what this man is saying. Why? Because my heart was already postured. I was ready to receive. I was ready to find a person who's going ahead of me. And I desire the anointing that person has. You know, it's very interesting. I mean, right now there are probably seven, eight, eight thousand churches spread across the world. And yet the man started the movement from college as, as a student. He's only turned 60 now. So in his lifetime, the lifetime of a person, not even lifetime because his first 20 years don't even count. In that short time, six, seven, eight thousand churches? That's wow. Somebody gotta be crazy. Somebody gotta be crazy. Yeah. I don't have that. There is no strategy I've ever been taught. Even if you go to Harvard Business School, you cannot do that. Do you ever hear people saying, by the way, if you want to get rich, just plant a church? Have you heard guys say that? <laughs> Especially the analysts. Huh? Ah, churches are just businesses. Nowadays, if you want to get rich, just start a church. You'll see how much money you'll make. I say, you try. <laughs> you try. 
<laughs> just start. Go to Jivanji and preach to people and see. <laughs> you start. You'll be so shocked, by the way. It's not easy to plant a church. It's not easy to start a church. It's not easy to grow a church. If you ever see a person, by the way, with a big church, there's anointing working in that person. Yeah. By the way, that's why I don't... I, 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 you'll never see me criticizing church leaders. Even when I can see that somebody is doing something crazy, I want to first of all understand, but I also understand that there is an anointing. Now, the anointing may be from another kingdom. It's very possible. Because even other, the other kingdom, they understand anointing. You need, to you need to know that. The other kingdom understands anointing. But I need you to understand, you're criticizing a person, there's an anointing behind that person. Whether it's God's kingdom anointing or another kingdom anointing. So I tend to think about it. I want to approach it from a spiritual perspective. What's going on here spiritually? So I'm, I'm the last person you see criticizing a church leader. I might, I might, if, I, if I can, I'll go and speak to them privately. But I'm not going to start writing articles about them. Because I understand that there are some spiritual things happening. Politicians understand anointing, by the way. Kenyan politicians. I don't know about politicians in other parts of the world, but Kenyan politicians, or is it African politicians? Yeah. They're leaders who just go and stand in front of people and they just do, huh? And the congregation goes, ah! <laughs> Millions of people and they're all going, huh? That's not human. <laughs> Guys, watch these things from a spiritual perspective. Yeah. They, they go and tap into powers. And often those are not God's powers. But there's an anointing that they're looking for as well an anointing they're looking for as well. Let me talk about... By the way, just ask your neighbor, are, are we together? Because I might, I might have left somebody behind. <laughs> Am I, are, are we together? <laughs> yeah. Please make sure you're not left behind here. Because if you're left behind on this first talk, I really I don't even know what will happen. This is like standard one. Because from here now we move into, we'll move into more complicated things. Hey. Now, eight ways to receive an anointing. I'm going to end with this. Eight ways to receive an anointing. This, this first talk was a bit long because I wanted to just set the tune for the rest of the weekend. How do people receive an, an anointing, especially in the scripture? How do, we, how do we learn about receiving anointing? First way that we see in the scripture is on the death of an anointed leader. The leader dies and the anointing is passed. We've just seen the example of Elijah, isn't it? Elijah, okay, in his case, technically doesn't die, but he leaves the earth and that anointing is transferred to Elisha. The case of Jesus. Jesus, again, leaves the earth and the anointing is transferred to his disciples. So the leader leaves and then the anointing is transferred. Moses leaves and then the anointing is transferred to Joshua. So, so there's a thing there. Um, when people receive the Spirit, it's passed on to them. And in that case, then you start to see certain things in that person that are similar to the anoint the person that they had before. People saw Elijah and they realized. You know, they said, this, there's a man who used to pour water on Elijah's hands. There's something about that guy that connects him to the anointing that went before. They saw John the Baptist and they said, this man has an anointing. When they saw the disciples, they marveled because they noticed these ones have been with Jesus. When that anointing is passed on, there's something in your ministry that resembles the ministry of the person who passed it on. So this is a, a, a passing on. There's a story, if you read about, if you ever, how many of you have heard of Reinhard Bonke? He was a great evangelist, uh, preached the gospel, a German, preached the gospel across Africa, did humongous, some of the largest crusades uh, ever, uh, just largest gatherings of human beings ever. Uh, I think in Nigeria he had like, was it like 7 million people? It was like insane numbers of people and preached the gospel there. Uh, he has an amazing story, his ministry story, where he's a student living in the UK, uh, going back to Germany, and he decides to visit. He's just uh, he, uh, on his way, there's a stopover. So he decides to take a walk in the town, and then he says, he sees a name. And the name that he sees was uh, George Jeffries. And he thinks, oh, it's just a name on a mailbox. And in school, they had learned about a great Welsh evangelist who had preached revival across the whole of Wales and across England. Uh, and he was a man who God had used to form a great movement of churches. Even a, I think it even exists today, Elim churches. In Mumbai, if you go, if those of you in Mombasa, you always see Elim when you're passing there. It was started by this great man. And so when Bonke saw that name, he thought, ah, surely, that's a coincidence. 
We've been learning about a guy like this in church history. It can't be this one. So he went and knocked, and the lady came. He says, oh, I'm looking. Is this, is this a George, Jeff, the, the, the one who preached? And the lady is like, eh, uh, this is not appropriate. She's about to close the door, and she had the voice saying, uh-uh, let him come in. And he walked in, and he found the old man, really old. And the man said, please have a seat. Tell me about yourself. And the man told him. And then the guy said, okay, I just feel like I want to pray for you. And he just laid hands on him and prayed a sick, like he prayed a deep prayer. And Bonk is like, wow, this was so cool. You know, it's those stories of people who wouldn't believe this story. And then he went back, caught his train and went to, to Germany. And then he was there just a, a, a few days later. His dad told him, by the way, you've ever heard about this guy? The George Jeffrey? He says, yeah. He says, the guy died. It's in the newspaper. He died yesterday. And he said, oh, really? I have a story about him. In fact, his dad didn't believe because he's like, really? <laughs> Seriously? <laughs> he's like, no, no, he laid hands on me. <laughs> but you know what? This man went on to have an incredible evangelistic ministry that equaled and even rivaled George Jeffries before him. A leader passing on and handing off anointing. And so that's one of the ways. Uh, I'm not ready to die yet, so... <laughs> So hold on for that one. <laughs> Number two, transfer from a living leader. Transfer from a living leader. This is when anointing is removed from a leader who is still alive and transferred to someone else. And usually the reason for that is because of sin. You can actually lose your anointing. Uh, if you read the story, there's, there's, there's scripture stories like that, by the way. People who lost their anointing in scriptures. Uh, the priest Eli was a great example. Remember Eli? Eli was a dude who was, he was actually the ruler of... Uh, and in those days, it was such a powerful role because you were the priest, but he was also a judge. A judge was the guy who was actually like the king of Israel at the time, before they had kings. So you're the national leader, but you're also the spiritual leader. So it was a combined role before this was divided later. And he's such an important person, but this man is completely complacent about honoring God, especially when it comes to his children. He loved his kids too much that he spoiled them and he didn't let them grow up in God's ways and his kids ran amok and people came to complain to him, your kids are messing around in the temple and he was that father who was passive. Let me tell you, your children can cause you to lose your anointing. Wow. You need to take your parenting very seriously by the way. When you see children of believers running around amok not listening to, to discipline, not being able to sit. We, we, we understood that, by the way. My wife and I, when, we were growing, when our kids were young, we understood that our kids are very important for our ministry. And so we taught them God's ways. We did the, if you've never done the Leia class, it was a lifesaver. We ended up doing it three times, by the way. You know, those people have to do something like, okay, not my wife, me. Me, I had to do it three times to understand it. Huh? It's like, you do it, then your kid enters another stage, you're like, hey, let's do the class again. <laughs> we, we just did a, we, re, we rewound the course. Because we understood that these kids are very critical to our ministry. And Eli did not. And so he lost. If you read the scripture in 1 Samuel chapter 2 verse 13, it says, Therefore the Lord God of Israel declares, this was a prophet who came to Eli, I promise that members of your family would minister before me forever. This is what God had promised. Imagine God had actually declared it over him. <laughs> but now the Lord declares, far be it from me. Can God change his mind? Yes, he can. He said, I promise, but I've changed my mind. He says, those who honor me, I will honor, but those who despise me will be disdained. And he says, the time is coming when I will cut short your strength and the strength of your priestly house so that no one in it will reach old age. You will see distress in my dwelling. Although good will be done to Israel, no one in your family line will ever reach old age. That's what Eli was told. The anointing is about to leave your family permanently. And then in verse 35, he says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who will do according to what is in my heart and mind. I will firmly establish his priestly house and they will minister before my anointed one always. In other words, the thing that I've given to you, I'm taking it away from you. And guess what? I'm going to give it to somebody else. Yeah. It's like you choose to dishonor me. I'm taking away my spirit from you, my anointing from you. Remember David actually said, take not thy Holy Spirit from me? Yes. Yeah, he understood this thing. He understood that God can take away the power he's given you, the anointing he's given you. And David had actually seen it happen. Why? Because that same Samuel was used by God to take the kingly anointing from Saul. Wow. 
and to give it to David. Yeah. God actually came and told Saul, I'm done. I've changed my mind about you as well. First Samuel 16, 1. The Lord said to Saul, how long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I've chosen one of his sons to be king. God removed the anointing from this person who did not desire it anymore and gave it to somebody who was more worthy of it. That's called transference. My prayer is it will never happen to anybody in this church. Amen. It's not our portion. It's not our portion. Number three, anointing can be shared from one to many. This is not transference. This is sharing. This is when God takes the anointing of one leader and he distributes it to many leaders to help with the work. Remember Moses in Numbers. God told him, take 70 leaders. Take 70 leaders. And I'm going to pour the spirit. I'm going to take that spirit that is in you, that anointing, and I'm going to distribute it to those 70. And those 70 will be able to do what you do. And they're going to help you with the heavy work of leading this great nation. Man, I love that one. I really love that one. In fact, for me, my prayer is that this is the one that's going to happen in my life. I've come to understand in life, what you don't, you don't need a successor. Never listen. You know what they tell you in corporate or training, succession planning? You don't need a successor. You need successors. There's nobody in scripture who left a, a successor who succeeded. Wow. If you leave one person to take over your ministry, it will die. You think about it. Which person passed on ministry successfully to one person? Doesn't work. King David does it. Doesn't work. Solomon blows it up. Elijah does it to Elisha. It dies there. <laughs> Have you ever thought about that? Greatest prophet, but he had no successor. It always dies when you pass it to one person. You think of any place in scripture, the only time succession works is when it comes from one to many. Jesus is the best example. Yeah. It's 12 people, and those 12 become 12 Jesuses. Paul, he has so many disciples. You talk about Timothy, you talk about Titus, you talk about Luke. There, he has so many of them. Ma, and, and you know, he has some who even leave, Demas. There are some who even become like Salites, traitors, those who leave you. <laughs> and Jesus, Ju, Jesus has those as well, isn't it? If Jesus had a Judas, don't worry, you're not that special. Even you people leave you. <laughs> but I was talking to one of our campus pastors, I was like, Somebody, they, I can't believe they left our church. I say, if Jesus was left, even you would be left. Wow. Yeah, they, exactly. So have many, because some of them will leave. Hey. Don't be afraid of that. Some of them will leave. But I'm talking about shared from one to many. And I believe this is a great way for all of us to multiply our lives. The anointing in our lives is through making disciples, raising other people who are like you. I really am grateful right now that if something was to happen to me today, and if I was to die, <laughs> by the way, if I died, they'll be like, it's like God had told him, eh? No, God hasn't told me. Let me just put it on record. <laughs> if, if, if it happens, it wasn't because I knew. I didn't know. But if something was to happen to me today, I'm so grateful that I have Pastor Godwin, that I have Pastor James, that I have Pastor Milton, that I have Pastor Kevin, that I have Pastor Victor. I have successors. Yeah. And so because of that, Mavuno will not die. In fact, it will go from strength to strength. When succession is done that way, the thing becomes better than when the person was there. The ministry was actually better after Jesus left. What a shock. <laughs> yeah. So, passed on from one to many. Make that your goal. Passing on the thing in your life. Number four, passed on but modified. Passed on but modified. This one I also like. This is when the anointing is passed on from one leader to another but is modified in the process. Generally, it's because... Sometimes you pass on your anointing to somebody, but that person has a, within the same vision, but a very different calling. So think about Moses. Moses passed on. He was told by God, anoint this young man, lay your hands on him. And he did. He anointed Joshua. But after that, God's calling on Joshua was to be a warrior. God's calling on Moses was not to be a warrior. Moses was a lawmaker. He was a peacemaker. But Joshua was a warmonger. He was, you know, there's some guys who are anointed for war. Joshua was one of those guys. There's no battle he lost except when they sinned. He was just a great warrior. And so it's like 
take on the same anointing of Moses, but Joshua, I'm calling you for something different. Wow. You're still leading the same people, but the season is going to be different. Yeah. And so you're more, this is anointed, this is passed on, but modified. Some anoint, same anointing, different task. Number five, passed on, but upgraded. Even this one I really like. This one is Elijah and Elisha, isn't it? Give me your spirit. It's the same anointing. Aha, but I want double portion. Come on. I want twice what this person has. And you know what? You need to pray this for your own disciples. It's a difficult thing, yes. But you need to pray that your disciples will get double the anointing in your life. Because you want your ministry to outlast you, isn't it? Wow. Jesus is the one who taught us this. He says in John 14, 12, you will do greater things than these. It's like, I don't even know whether he's, is he prophesying? Is he like telling them you have to do greater things than these? It's like, guys, you can't do what I did. You have to do greater. Because I'm now going to be interceding for you. I'm going to be with the Father. You're going to have help. So you have to go farther than I went. And indeed, they do greater things than Jesus. Because he's guiding. This, this is, it's, the anointing is passed on, but it's at the next level. It's at the next level. I love this one. You know, it's interesting because my dad was a pastor and he was a great man of God. My goodness, he was such a good pastor. Um, and I remember just watching him. I mean, he was a bivocational pastor for the longest because he had a career, he served in government, but he was, a, a, he was in his church, he was as good as any bivocation, bivoc pastor here. And he preached on Sundays, but the rest of the week he preached at his workplace. And then he became, when he retired, he actually became a full-time minister. Um, I remember the time when I told him I was going to become a pastor, he was in shock because it wasn't something he tried to pass on to me. We weren't taught we should be pastors. I didn't think he had that expectation. But when he had that, then he was like, I bless you, son. And he blessed me and laid hands on me. But you know what? I've done things in ministry that my father never did. My father was a church planter. In his time, he planted probably about 10 different churches. And I think in almost all those churches, he put up builders, by the way. It's a builder. For me, I've got 55, 56, and I'm just beginning. Yeah. So that's, that's a different level from my father's anointing. And the buildings are going to be many more than 10. Because I believe in this season, I've received the anointing of a builder. Uh, I've received the anointing of a builder. you will receive it as well in Jesus name that's called passed on but upgraded remember to desire the anointing people when you see your pastor when you see me up somewhere you should be saying I desire greater than what this man is achieving yeah I desire greater than this when you see Pastor Caro and I say we desire to be greater than this ones Pastor Matri you and Pastor James desire to be greater than us by far yeah by far you and James you have to desire to go much farther than us impact many more families than we have. Yeah, desire it. It's yours. But you have to desire it. You have to want it. Number six, passed on but diminished. Passed on but diminished. This one I don't like. This is when anointing is passed on from one leader to the other. But then in being passed on, it is scattered. It's, 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 it's not at the same level. You see this when the anointing of kingship is passed from David to his sons. And in Solomon's time, Solomon receives a, ma a magnificent kingdom, even grows it. But because of sin, the anointing diminishes. And God comes and tells Solomon, you know what? I will take out the kingdom from your hands and I'll give it to another. But because of my love for David, wow. what is that? First Kings 11, 35. He says, I will not take the whole kingdom out of Solomon's hand. I've made him ruler all the days of his life for the sake of David, my servant, who I chose. In other words, the anointing was working in Solomon's li life, not because of Solomon, but because of David. Wow. Like, I love David so much, I want to see his son succeed. But this son has now defied me. So the kingdom will be pulled away from him, but I can't take it away from him because of David. It's too close. David is too close. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide the kingdom. And I'm going to give, and God is telling the enemy, by the way, he's telling Jeroboam this. So I'm going to give you most of the kingdom. And for the sake of my servant David, I'm going to leave a little bit with his descendants forever. Wow. wow. 
I mean, the, the good thing about this is it shows you how God can be so into you that even your rebellious de- descendants are blessed because of you. Imagine. That is so powerful. That's God's love. But the sad story here is that you can lose an anointing that was passed on to you. An anointing can be passed and you have it and you take it for granted and it goes. And it goes. Can I say something on this one? This wasn't something I was planning to say, but it's true. Many times, when, you re- when you're operating under anointing, it's easy to not understand that you're operating under anointing. It's very easy to be in ministry and you're succeeding in ministry and you're in Mavuno uh, Down Network and you're thriving in your ministry and you don't understand there's a cover that I'm operating under. And it's very easy at that time to begin to say, by the way, even me, I can preach like Papa Kilo. Yeah. I mean, what, what's the big deal? He's just showing up on Sunday. Speakers, speakers we can carry. Even him, he rents a venue. Ven- venue we can rent. Lights, he's just hiring. I'm wearing red, surely. I can change my whole outfit. Saying, come on, man! Even me, I can say that. <laughs> But I'm laughing, but it's not funny because there are some people who, who need to get this one. It's very easy to presume on the anointing you're operating under. And to just decide, by the way, me, I'm even going to go and start my own little church. Yeah, I'm going to start my downtown association of the Holy Spirit International. Because that one never used to have international, it was not Holy Spirit fields. <laughs> and start your service. Oh my God, what a shock. What a shock. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe I should stop on that one. Already somebody's offended, but... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Pastor Milton knows someone's offended. What are the dangers? Oh, my goodness. One, you've just led people who trust you you see, I gave you authority. And that authority I passed on to you. And I gave you sheep to look after. And I trusted that to you. You've just taken those sheep away from the anointing that God had placed them in to bless their lives. So the danger is not just to you, but it is the lives that you are destroying by pulling them out of where God put them. Wow. It is a crazy place to be. It's a crazy place to be. Tell your neighbor, far be it from you. Yeah. From you. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't underestimate the place of anointing. Don't underestimate it. You look at Pastor Godwin and you're like, but he's so young. Huh? Pastor no- I mean, this one's probably when they were in primary school, you were in college. In fact, you're a teacher, you're teaching primary school teachers. <laughs> and you look at them and say, these ones are the pastors. Surely, I can do better than this. Don't ever underestimate the place of the anointing. I've come to see it, guys. It's not, it's not skill. Some people think churches grow because of a pastor's skill. Or because the pastor is handsome. And you're thinking, me, I'm even more handsome than that pastor. <laughs> Number seven. Previous anointing reintroduced. Previous anointing. I'm just trying to give you all the pictures in the scripture where anointing is introduced. Previous anointing reintroduced. John 1.17 he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. John was, being, was not even born, but the angel was already at this point prophesying and saying, this man will have the spirit that you saw in Elijah. And by this time, Elijah was a huge prophet in Israel. He was known as Israel's like the miracle working prophet of Israel. And the angel Gabriel is telling his father, that anointing you saw then is about to be reintroduced. And there's actually a reintroduction. This man operates just like Elijah. He dresses like Elijah. I mean, the guy, I don't know why, camel hair. That's what they wear. Camel hair is not comfortable, by the way. It's not like sheepskin or something. It's like prickly, you know. Uh, Live in the desert. He lived in the wilderness just like Elijah. Uh, 
I don't think it was a fashion statement. I think it was more of just a life of simplicity. Like Elijah lived a crazy life of simplicity. He ate locusts and honey. He ate the stuff that was, you didn't even have to be a farmer. He didn't even want the responsibility of being a farmer. He just wanted to wait on God and live a simple life. And that's the same anointing John has. John has the anointing of confronting kings, just like Elijah. Elijah confronted kings. John confronted the king. Elijah had the, I guess anointing also has a shadow side. Uh, <laughs> they were both intimidated by queens. They could put the kings in their place, but when it came to the women, they ran. <laughs> In fact, in John's case, he, his head was even cut off. Yeah, they, it's so interesting. Their lives are so similar. But it's like an ancient anointing was reintroduced in this person's life. That's one of the examples that we see of that happening in Scripture. By the way, I believe that God wants us to desire the anointings of the people we read about in Scripture. Yeah. I believe he wants this. When you read Scripture, who is that person your heart resonates with? Just tell your neighbor, who's that person you're like, I like this person. I'd like to be like this person. Is there someone like that? I mean, you've never read the Bible. Who's that person you're like, whenever you read, you're like, I really like this person. I really feel this person. I really feel them. Yeah. Desire. Desire that anointing. By the way, who did you say? Somebody shout out somebody. David. Solomon. Deborah. I don't know if Solomon, the guy, wants, is, he wants to have many wives or he just wants money. <laughs> or maybe it's wisdom. No, no, it has to be Bible. Esther. Paul. David. Kill giants. Come on, somebody. I want to be a giant killer. For me, by the way, mine is Paul. I love Paul. The apostle to the Gentiles. The man who was willing to give his life with no fear. That churches will be planted everywhere. Churches everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I desire that anointing of Paul. So desire it. Ancient anointings can be reintroduced. I believe they will be in our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And then the last one, and I want to conclude with this one. New and original anointing. New and original anointing. This is a person God brings to the scene and anoints to do things that have never been seen before. Like things that no, they don't exist. There's no point of reference for them. It's completely, no eye has ever seen <laughs> what this person came and did. No, there was nothing they could relate it to. And this actually, they're, they're, they're not many, but they're there. They're actually in scripture. You're going to find someone like Moses. There was no one like that before him. In fact, I don't think there's ever been like him. A man who could actually take a, a nation of slaves with the anointing to turn them, a, a, a group of slaves and turn them into a powerful nation. That's a, pow that's a great anointing. Nobody else That's, that's an anointing never seen before or after. Because after that, there was always a king and a prophet that was separate and the priest was separate. Samuel actually was the first person who just carried all those three. Um, there's Elijah. Elijah was the first miracle working prophet in the Old Testament. Um, it was so interesting because the Old Testament is not full of miracles. Uh, there's probably just two miracle working prophets, really. It's Elijah and Elisha. But the anointing starts with Elijah. And that's probably why when Jesus is meeting, when, 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 when Israelites thought of the, the prophets, it's Elijah who represented the prophets. Because he stood tall as the first one who had this anointing, uh, where miracles were happening around him. Uh, Paul, Paul was a globe-trotting apostle. He's the, only, he's the first person who received that anointing of understanding the gospel is for everyone and going to go to the whole world. These are very rare. They're very rare. But I want to mention them because they, they happen. Sometimes you'll see them happening. But usually, with anointing, it harkens back to something else. It's usually transmitted uh, through someone else. Now, I want to say this. We've learned about the importance of anointing. We've learned truths about anointing. We've, re we've learned how it's received. The anointing is God's power, Holy Spirit power to accomplish your specific calling. And it comes only from God. But he uses others to pass it on. Most of the time, he will use others to pass it 